Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Food Day in Schools, How to Get Involved, the Green Strikes webinar series. Uh, we are very excited to have so many participants on the call today, and we are even more excited to have uh, this joint webinar that we present together with the U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools Recognition Award. And uh, we hope that uh, these tools and resources that will be presented today will help uh, the webinar participants not only to participate in Food Day, but also to move towards health and wellness go goals that were established by the U.S. Department of Education to recognize the schools that uh, are excellent in uh, the criteria uh, for the Green Ribbon Schools Award. So uh, the uh, way uh, we will uh, run the webinar is that um, we'll start with uh, several technical introductions on uh, the webinar platform, and then uh, have uh, a brief introduction on the food day and the resources that food day offers. And then we have terrific partners today uh, with us, uh, Kurt Bergstrom from WorldLink. Uh, who will uh, talk about the Irish curriculum, and uh, Hannah Jones uh, from the Center for Science and the Public Interest, their organization that founded Food Day, and also Pamela Koch, their creator of their uh, Food Day school curriculum, together with Isabel Contento from the Teachers College at Columbia University. So Catherine, I'll pass it to you now for several technical notes. Great, thank you. Uh, this is Catherine Castleman. I'm the project coordinator with you today. And uh, I'm just going to tell you a few posts of the webinar platform. Um, for those of you who haven't used it before, um, you can type questions at any time, questions or comments, into the dashboard that you see on your screen. And um, if you're having trouble hearing one of the presenters, you can also um, type into the dashboard to let us know. Um, and we'll have a Q&A session after um, several of the presenters here. Um, we also wanted to let you know we're recording this call, um, and the slides and video will be available on our website at foodday.org slash webinars. And it will also be sent to the registrants by email. Um, if you have any questions, please contact us at foodday at cspinet.org. Um, so thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to be unmuted during the Q&A, we can also do that if you want to press the raise hand icon, which you see on your dashboard there. So um, you can either do that or type in your comment or question. Thanks. I'll turn it back over to Lilia. Thank you, Catherine. So I, uh, I'd like to pass over to Andrea Suarez Falcon, who is the director of Green Strides. Series uh, of the Green Ribbon Schools at the U.S. Department of Education. Andrea, are you on the call? I am. How are you this afternoon? Uh, we are doing very well. Thank you. We are excited to have you here. Great. Well, thank you so much for presenting. And as Lilia uh, mentioned, this is part of a series of uh, webinars that we're really excited to present uh, to you. The U.S. Department of Education is trying to put all of these webinars related to health, facilities, environmental education, nutrition, green schools, all in one place. So they're actually all listed now. And we're adding to that site every day. Uh, so feel free to check out ed.gov slash green dash strides. And it's uh, related to our award, which Lilia mentioned. And I'll mention that just a really briefly. Um, but the important thing to note is that all schools are eligible to join webinars like this one and use the resources that we've listed on those pages. So please make use of them. Please join us for other webinars. There, uh, we have webinars every week. Um, all week long we have from uh, all different federal agencies, from different nonprofit groups, topics ranging the areas of the award. And that award, as William mentioned, is called U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools. And uh, as she mentioned, my name is Andrea Falk, and I direct that award here at the U.S. Department of Education. And what we're aiming to do with that award is not to certify hundreds and thousands of schools. There are many programs out there that help to uh, move schools through uh, uh, improvements in, in, in their facilities or in their health or in their environmental health or, or with gardens. 
and we, we don't want to be another certification, what we're aiming to do is just shine the spotlight on a few exemplary schools in all three areas, what we call our three pillars. That's uh, reducing environmental impact and cost. That's pillar one. Pillar two is improving health and wellness. Uh, there we include uh, nutrition and fitness. So Food Day falls into pillar two of U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon Schools. And also environmental health. And then pillar three is our environmental education, sustainability education. And there we include civics, uh, green career pathways, uh, agricultural education, uh, STEM are all part of that pillar. The idea with the award then is that we're standing up a few exemplary schools in each state. Each state education agency nominates up to four schools and one district each year. Uh, we now have a district sustainability awardee as well. So uh, the idea is that each, um, uh, each state nominates up to four schools in a district, and then we uh, shine a spotlight on a few exemplary schools and districts, and in doing so, get the word out about the resources that they're using. Because in fact, the resources that they're using are available in most cases to all schools. They're that great list of resources that is available on the Green Stride site I mentioned, and that's ed.gov slash green dash strides. If you want more interest, uh, information on the award, it's at ed.gov slash green dash ribbon dash schools. And again, it, uh, schools and districts don't apply to the US Department of Education. They apply to their state. And state's participation is voluntary. And then um, they uh, get nominated after a state selection process. But again, all schools are welcome to join the webinars and use the resources. We invite you to uh, tune in and um, learn from this afternoon's presentation and then check out uh, the other sessions we have coming up. And we are really grateful uh, to Lilia and our colleagues at uh, Food Day at the Center for Science and Public Interest for presenting this wonderful session and to all of you for taking the time this afternoon to learn with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea, so much. Uh, we hope that we'll, uh, we'll be able to give some tools for this webinar on how to uh, help schools achieve their health and wellness goals and uh, participate also in food day and use the momentum. And we are excited to, to have this presentation together with you. So uh, during the webinar, you can use the social media um, handles and uh, uh, ED Green Ribbon is for the Green Ribbon Schools Food Day 2013 a hashtag and handle, and also a Food Ad a hashtag for food education. Food Day has put together a lot of resources for schools, and this year's main theme is food education for children, and in particular, uh, cooking skills and all the skills connected with the knowledge about uh, about the food system. Here uh, is a sample. Uh, one of them is. Uh, a nutrition insert produced together with Chop Chop that has four pages on how to navigate the food environment, read the nutritional label, and think smart about uh, food choices. School curriculum uh, uh, produced uh, by the Columbia Teachers College and Pamela Koch will talk more about it uh, later during the call. And uh, just yesterday, we released the infographic about children's diets and put some information together that you can find on foodday.org slash infographic and more resources on foodday.org slash schools. I also wanted to mention the resources from one of our partner group, uh, Hip Hop Public Health. Uh, they are uh, based from New York, and uh, they have terrific comics and video games about health and diet. Here you can see just two of them, Escape from Soda Island and Watch Your Calories, and they are releasing Songs for Health America on 30th of September that are produced by uh, leading hip hop singers and they talk about health. Uh, mostly their targets are teenagers and kids and uh, I think that uh, uh, this first public CD that they, they will release will, will, will be really uh, great and very engaging. In May, uh, Food Day and Jamie Oliver Food Foundation launched a campaign uh, called Food Education in Every School with the aim of making uh, food education uh, more available in schools. 
and uh, moving towards a more literate, a food literate society. It's a very ambitious goal. Uh, so far, 60 national groups signed on the campaign, and more than 5,000 individuals. And you can follow the conversations on uh, food ad hashtag or uh, check on Food Day website for more information on uh, what uh, are their developments of this campaign. On Food Day itself, the one action for the um, entire country is let's get cooking with kids. And we hope you'll join us on Food Day to teach kids how to cook uh, at school or at home. There, there are more resources on uh, Let's Get Cooking page on foodday.org. And to participate in this national uh, action is very easy. Uh, you just uh, organize a cooking class and register it on the national map of Food Day events. And in the coming weeks, we'll provide uh, more resources on uh, Let's Get Cooking page. Uh, there is already a Food Day cookbook with the recipes from some of America's best chefs, uh, Food Day recipe cards. And um, we are working on a selection of recipes that every kid should know that are coming soon in, a, in the following weeks. So if you have any questions, please uh, get in touch with us on foodday at cspinet.org. We hope that your food day events will be terrific at schools. And if you can, please join the action that Get Cooking with Kids on Food Day. So now I would like to pass uh, the word to Kirk uh, Bergstrom. Kirk is the executive director of uh, WorldLink nonprofit based in San Francisco. And uh, the guide that um, his uh, group created uh, in collaboration with Center for Ecoliteracy is the Nourish curriculum that has amazing resources about food and sustainability. Thank you so much, Lilia, and hello to our far-flung uh, virtual network. Uh, I wanted to spend uh, just a few minutes talking about sort of our common enterprise as educators and what really distinguishes our Nourish initiative. And then I'll walk through the many resources that we have available through our website. Uh, our purpose for the Nourish Initiative is simple, to open a meaningful conversation about food and sustainability, uh, particularly in schools and communities. And we think it's important to link uh, an inquiry into food with how that fits into a sustainable future. So we look for, for links between the two. Our tagline for Nourish is, what's the story of your food? We think that question really opens up this world of uh, learning. And uh, when you discover the who, what, where, when, why, and how of your food, um, you begin to discover connections and relationships. And that's the kind of thinking that we want students to, to uh, undertake. Um, there's this wonderful quote from Michael Pollan, which says, the biggest question to ask yourself about food is, where did this come from? And that begins the telling of the story. And so it really is about creating this narrative where we are critical actors in this larger story. Kirk, we don't see your slides yet. So uh, I wonder if we have some technical uh, issues with that. Oh, really? Um, is that something that I have to activate, or do you do that, Lilia? Uh, so I have passed you the, the screen, and you can accept and show uh, share your screen. Oh, yeah, we see them now. OK. Well. I'm sorry that you weren't seeing that as I <laughs> was talking. Let me just quickly uh, review where I was then. So as I mentioned, uh, the purpose of Nourish to open a meaningful conversation about food and sustainability. Um, this tagline of what's the story of your food, which really creates this sense of a, a larger relationship to food and the food system. Uh, our, our quote from, from Michael Pollan. Uh, and what we use is kind of the, the frame for the work we do. And I think it applies really well to what joins us in, in common endeavor is this notion of food literacy. And it's, it's very similar and analogous to what Lilia spoke of as food education. Um, we think a wonderful question, though, is you know how do you become food literate? How food literate are you? And we really see it as a spectrum where there you know, are some people that uh, are still very food illiterate, and that through a process of learning and practice, we really can create a much more food literate society, and, and that's our goal. 
And we use this very simple definition for food literacy, which is understanding the story of your food from farm to table and back to the soil. And what that Sorry, really says... Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I, I have a, a, a black screen, and Catherine, I wonder what you see, if this is the same that I see. Yes, um, I think there's just a problem with the slides loading. Um, so we don't see what, what Kirk is clicking through. Ah, that's too bad. You know, I wonder if I... Oh, oh I think if you make it smaller, we see them, yeah. Okay, maybe when it's full screen, that's uh, the issue. Okay, well, we'll go with the, the modestly sized uh, version here. Okay, uh, but we see it perfectly. Sorry for the technical issue. <laughs> Uh, all part of, of the uh, virtual experience. Uh, so as I was saying, food literacy we find is a, a really wonderful frame to describe the, the work we're doing and uh, this definition of understanding the story of your food from farm to table and back to the soil really um, says that food literacy is about understanding the whole. Uh, it's about starting with the whole and working to the more specific. So it's really sort of the life cycle of food. And you know, I think this is really critical if we're going to cultivate systems thinking uh, in young people. And it's really a way that we can begin to draw the many connections that exist uh, related to food and to health and to, to sustainability. Um, why does food literacy matter? Uh, you know, our experience is that when people are more food literate, good things happen, and that can be all sorts of individual and community initiative from, you know, really uh, improving the experience of school lunch or school garden, uh, bringing curriculum into the classroom, uh, opportunities for community service, uh, whatever it may be. So, you know, there, there's a direct payoff when you have more food literate students and, and a more food literate uh, community. Uh, we also think that food literacy is the first step in shifting a food culture, and we think that's the really important mission. Um, because if we're going to design uh, a new food system, we certainly need a new food culture. So all of our resources are really oriented to that goal. Um, here's a brief overview of some of the Nourish resources. So we have a, a PBS special that was produced that's now available at the DVD. We have a wonderful website at uh, nourishlife.org, which I'm going to uh, tour shortly. Um, we have two DVDs, uh, one that has 54 short films and one that has this uh, PBS special. And then we have a free curriculum, which I'm also going to preview. Um, here's an a image of the cover of the, the curriculum. As Lilia said, we were honored to work with the Center for Eco-Literacy in, in developing this. And, it's uh, a free download from our website, and it's just packed with great resources. It's also aligned uh, to curriculum standards for science, uh, social studies, uh, English language arts, and also for uh, health. And we really think that this notion of food literacy and creating uh, a healthy food culture you know, is a community enterprise. So. Uh, we always encourage that anytime uh, educators are bringing this into the curriculum or into the school, that they try to involve as many individuals, both within the school and outside, in the conversation, uh, because that's really you know part of uh, the success story. And um, I'm now going to bring up our website. Is that uh, visible, Lilia? Uh, Lily, yes, could you can confirm you're saying that? Yes, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so quickly, I'm just going to run through some things here. This is the home page. Uh, we're always highlighting resources and stories. We've got uh, this section um, called videos where we have, um, I think, about uh, 30 short films now available on all sorts of topics. Uh, that uh, include things like school lunch, edible education, farmers markets, uh, from the soil. Uh, you can kind of see the range in season, uh, trying something new with Jamie Oliver, et cetera, et cetera. So feel free to you know use any of these. They're typically one to two minutes in length, and they're wonderful for sort of 
pod starters and discussion tools. Under this Teach tab, you can access the NERSH curriculum. This is where the free download is. Um, if you look in the right-hand column there, you'll see some of the activities include one on the story of food, one on seasonal local foods, one on food traditions, one on food and ecosystems, one on analyzing food ads, one on school lunch, and then kind of an action-oriented culminating project that we call Nourish Action Project. So that's all part of the curriculum, including uh, resources and a glossary, and it's really just a terrific tool. And if any of you are interested in uh, Spanish language student handouts, that's uh, also available as a free download. Um, under this Learn tab, I wanted to point out that we have this section called Perspectives. And these are wonderful Q&A uh, articles that we have uh, compiled with over 40 well-known figures from the food movement. And you know, you can learn about what's going on in a number of projects. Uh, you can uh, delve more deeply into themes like fair food and farmers markets and food ac access. So these can be used both for your own professional learning and also shared uh, as appropriate with your students. Um, under uh, the ACT tab, one thing I wanted to call your attention to is what we call Nourish in Action. So I'm going to open it for schools. And here we're curating kind of inspiring examples of what different uh, educators and schools are doing with the Nourish materials. Uh, so you can browse this to get all sorts of ideas about you know, how you might utilize the curriculum, the videos, and other tools we have. So it's really a great way to sort of see uh, the, the food movement in action, uh, particularly in, in schools. And if you're interested at the community level, we also have a, a Nourish in Action uh, for communities. Um, so we invite you wholeheartedly to take advantage of these resources. One thing I also wanted to point out is under the Act section, we have a Food Day page. And on that page, we are recommending uh, specific resources and ideas that can be applied at the community level, the school level, or even the home. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to present, and uh, best of luck to all of you. Thank you, Kurt, very much. Uh, thank you for the great presentation and for the wonderful resource that you um, you have worked on. And uh, now I would like to pass uh, the, the word to Hannah Jones. Hannah is Nutrition Policy Coordinator with the Center for Science in the Public Interest. And Hannah has uh, a lot of information about the back to school moment, school lunches, and also the new competitive food standards. So, uh, Hannah, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, pass you the, the screen so you can uh, share your slides. OK, we Great. can see them. You can see them OK? I'm going to try and get them to go from the full screen. Can you see them OK? Yes. Perfect. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it's great to be here to chat a little bit about what's going on around school foods. So as many of you know, it's been quite a busy couple of years in the school foods movement. At the state and local level, there's been a number of states and local school districts who have adopted policies to improve school nutrition environments. And then at the national level, the US Department of Agriculture is busy implementing the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act which included uh, school lunch and snack standards, additional funds for healthy school lunches, and a number of other provisions. So just as a little background to get started, every five years, Congress has to reauthorize the child nutrition program. And the 2010 Child Nutrition Reauthorization, which is known as the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act, was really the biggest step forward to date in our nation's effort to provide all children with healthy food in schools. As I mentioned before, the level of funding was substantially larger. It was actually 10 times bigger than the last reauthorization. And the law also made significant improvements to the program to, to the programs to address not only hunger, but also obesity. So here we are three years later, and a lot has happened since the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act passed in 2010. As many of you probably know, USDA recently finalized the new school meal standards, which started being implemented this past school year. And school meals will now have 
double the fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, only low fat and fat free dairy, limits on unhealthy fats and sodium. And then for the first time, it set reasonable limits um, on calories, so it would better address both hunger and obesity. And these pictures here on the slide are from actual school meals. Um, and I don't know about you, but they certainly uh, look nicer than a lot of the meals that I eat. So I, um, I definitely think schools are, are doing a great job. Um, schools across the country um, have been working hard to meet these standards over the past year and will continue to work as they are implemented over the next few years. Um, and while there have been some challenges, what we've seen overall is that schools really are making this transition and kids are actually trying and enjoying the new healthy options. So um, we actually got some numbers from USDA and that almost 80% of schools have indicated that they think they're meeting the new school lunch standards. So that's a really impressive number. Um, and these standards, like I said, have only been in effect for a year. So it's a, it's a really um, a impressive um, step forward for schools. During this back to school season, I would encourage all of you to take some time to find out if the schools in your area are among these many schools that are meeting the new standards. If they aren't meeting the standards, um, I would find out what the barriers are and see if you can help connect your school with the resources and technical assistance um, that's available to help the schools get there. USCA and other national and state organizations are offering lots of training and technical assistance. And then also schools have found it really helpful to engage students in the process, so through taste tests or having the kids vote on their favorite healthy entrees. Also, it's really important to engage parents and local advocates like yourself um, to get the word out about the new standards, um, to help support schools as they're doing this, and also to encourage kids to try um, maybe some unfamiliar options that are now available. I'm going to point you here to some of the resources that we have available. We have a number of model materials and tip, sheet, tip sheets excuse me, that um, advocates can use to support implementation of the meal standards, and that's at schoolfoods.org slash back to school. So in addition to the updates to the school meal standards, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act also required USDA to update the nutrition standards for all of the other foods that are sold in schools outside of the meal program. And these are sometimes called competitive foods because they compete directly with these school meals. And these are foods that are sold through vending machines, school stores, a la carte lines, snack bars, and on-campus fundraisers. And I just want to point out what they don't include. Um, this would not include foods that are given to students in the classroom, so through classroom snacks, or foods that are provided at classroom parties. Um, doesn't include foods and drinks that are given to athletes during practice or games, or, um, or foods that are sold outside of the school day through concession stands or, or other types of events. So what is the big deal about competitive foods? Well, the current standards for competitive foods haven't been updated in over 30 years. So they're incredibly out of date, and they really no longer make sense from the standpoint of nutrition science and public health concerns around child nutrition and obesity. So while some states and localities have made progress to improve the nutritional quality of the, the competitive food environment, there are still a number of unhealthy items um, available in schools, and they really undermine children's diets and weights, nutrition and food education, parents' ability to, um, and efforts to feed their kids healthfully. And then they also undermine these healthy school meals that we just talked about, because really what kids are going to buy this beautiful healthy school lunch with a fruit and a vegetable and a whole grain when they could go to the a la carte line and get pizza and a candy bar. Um, so it's a really important update. And the good news is that as a result of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, USDA did finalize the updated nutrition standards for all of these competitive foods that are sold in schools. And that was this past June that they released the, the interim final rule. These new standards are great. They're really strong. They include criteria that um, are based on recommendations from public health groups as well as existing standards that some states and localities had already started implementing, and then also standards that the food industry had generally agreed to. 
the standards include strong criteria for calories, fats, sugars, uh, sodium um, for food items. And then they would only allow water, low-fat milk, and 100% juice in elementary and middle schools, as well as some lower calorie drinks and diet drinks in high schools. One thing that is particularly important and strong about the new standards is that after a short phase in period, companies won't be able to just fortify snack foods with cheap nutrients um, to qualify them as healthy. So foods actually have to contain real food, like a fruit, a vegetable, a whole grain, um, or another healthy food component. Some have worried that if schools are no longer selling sports drinks or chips or unhealthy foods, um, that that might mean less money or revenue for schools because kids won't buy the healthy options. But what we've seen is that many schools and districts are finding they can make just as much money without selling the unhealthy foods. So a recent study by the Pew Charitable Trust found that when schools switch to healthier competitive food standards, in most cases they actually don't see a negative revenue impact. And in some cases, they end up seeing an increase in revenue because more kids start purchasing a meal. And when kids buy a school meal, the school is getting the kids' lunch money in some cases, as well as the additional reimbursement from USDA. So it's more financially, um, makes more financial sense for schools. Also, CSDI did a, a study um, that found that the money raised through vending machines is often quite modest. Um, so the study found that on a per student basis, school vending machine um, contracts typically only raise about $18 per student per year. And those funds could really be raised in healthier ways. So while sometimes schools do initially lose money when they're first starting out, most end up rebounding once the schools figure out the right mix of healthy products to sell and the kids get used to the new options and the healthier options. The new competitive food standards do also apply to school fundraisers that are taking, on, um, taking place on the school campuses during the school day. USDA does allow states to, um, to set some limited number of exemptions for fundraisers um, that don't meet the standards if those fundraisers are infrequent and they have to be school approved. But, school, but states don't have to, to allow those exemptions. Um, addressing fundraisers is a really vital aspect of improving school nutrition environments, but we found it can be a sensitive issue for some policymakers and, and other folks. We really need to help people understand that enlisting kids to sell unhealthy foods to their friends and families sends the wrong message and undermines kids' diets and nutrition and food education efforts. Many people don't realize that there are tons of fundraisers happening, happening in schools every day. Um, in many schools, there are regular sales of pizza outside the cafeteria at lunch, or maybe it's donuts as kids are coming in um, to school in the morning, or it could be candy um, in the hallway or at the end of the school day. It's really not just the monthly bake sale like some people have imagined. Also, branded fundraisers like selling Hershey's candy bars or Krispy Kreme donuts is a way that companies are marketing unhealthy eating to kids. So as far as the companies are concerned, these programs are really more about marketing their products and cultivating brand loyalty in kids um, than they are about selling a product or helping schools to raise money. So switching to healthy fundraisers doesn't have to mean less revenue. There are tons of profitable healthy fundraising alternatives, um, as you can see on this list here, from plant sales and fruit sales um, to fund runs and walkathons. We found those can be incredibly, incredibly financially um, successful for schools. CSPI has a number of fact sheets and a report called Sweet Deals that describes dozens of profitable and practical healthy fundraisers. Um, I encourage you to check it out. Experience really shows that schools can make just as much money with healthy fundraisers as with the unhealthy ones, but it's just a matter of finding the right fundraiser that works for your school um, or for the families and communities. So for the next steps on competitive foods, these standards will go into effect next school year. So that's the 2014 school year. 
Um, so now is a really good time to start talking to your school food service director, to school administrators, PTA members, teachers, students, to make sure they're aware that these changes are coming, why they're so important, and then helping to connect them with the resources and uh, best practices. So I'll end by pointing you to some materials that CSPI has um, and some websites here, both for competitive foods and for school meals and fundraisers. Um, I also would encourage you to follow CSPI on our social media. It's a great way to stay up to date with um, the work that we're doing around school food. And then you can also email me directly. Uh, my email address is there on the screen if you have questions or if you'd like direct links to any of these materials. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Lilia. I believe we're going to start some Q&A. Well, thank you for this great presentation. Uh, there is a question to you uh, from Rita Scott. Uh, what department at school uh, could answer if they are meeting standards? I'm sorry, could you repeat that once more? Uh, so the question is, which department at school uh, or, I guess, school district could answer the question if they are meeting the standards? Sure. So the school food service director should be able to answer the question, um, or the, the food service manager, whoever is in charge at that school, um, because the directors are, are who are actually applying to be certified to meet the new standards. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So uh, we are running a little bit out of time, so I will go ahead and uh, ask Pamela uh, Koch and Isabel Contento to make their presentation about uh, Food Day School Curriculum, and then we will open to questions and answers to all the three panelists. So uh, Pamela, I'm going ahead and uh, making you the presenter, so uh, everyone uh, can uh, see your shared screen. Perfect, we can see that. Okay, great. And I'm going to try to put it on a uh, slideshow and let's just see, tell me if, if, can you still see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for having me and, and it's an honor to follow Kirk and, and Hannah in this. And what I am going to be speaking about today is the school day food curriculum. And Dr. Isabel Contento and I from Teachers College Columbia University created this two years ago, um, and basically what we tried to make was a curriculum that was relatively simple, five lessons long, that schools could do right around food day. And what we tried to do is come up with five big target behaviors, we call them, that we really want um, students to actually do differently as a result of doing this curriculum. So they're on this slide. We want them to eat real, which is obviously to eat more whole foods, to eat mostly plants. Um, and those two things are to get students excited about eating good foods, foods that we want them to eat more of, basically um, more plants and more real food. And then the next one is not too much. And that's really trying to become aware of the portion sizes, particularly of processed foods that are currently in our environment, and also the too much of advertising for the foods that are not so healthy for us, so that we can really hone those down um, and basically complement that by eating more of the foods that are the things that are good for us. And then fourth is to navigate through the complex food environment we have and be an advocate for change. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about each one of these. So as I said before, eat real is to eat whole foods. And that is the theme of food day, so that's what we thought was a good theme to start this. And some of you might have noticed from reading our themes that they go with um, Michael Pollan's book, In Defense of Food, which is eat food, mostly plants, and not too much. Um, and basically when we were developing this, since he was on the Food Day Advisory Committee, he, we asked him if we could use those themes because we thought they made sense as a way to teach this to children as well. So for Eating Real, we teach children about how they can eat more foods that are right how they come from nature. So on this slide, these are cards that are in the curriculum, and they're low resolution here, but if you download the curriculum from the Food Day website, you will have these um, bigger, taking up the whole screen, and much better resolution. But the foods that are here, as you can see, are all foods that are right how they came from nature. So corn, uh, grilled chicken, oranges, milk, and brown rice. And there's the bar, the green bars on the side, 
which are how healthy that food is, and as you can see, they all have what nature put in them, so the combination of nutrients that nature put in them, and so they are, are really pretty healthy. Some of these foods are not exactly how they came from nature, and that's the red bar that is on the right side, shows the degree of processing in the foods. Then we can take those same foods and we can change them a little bit, and as we do that, we are actually um, often taking out some of the nutrients that are good for them. We might be adding in sugar, salt, or fat to make them less healthy for us, and then obviously doing that is also having an impact on the environment. So the healthfulness goes down a little bit for all of these, and the processing level goes up, and you can see the different degrees that it goes up for the different foods. Then we can take these same foods, and we can change them a lot, and when we change them a lot, then they become these really food products. And by that point in time, a lot of what was originally in those plants, so that frosted corn cereal on the top there, really doesn't retain much of the nutrients that were in the original corn because it's only parts of the corn and so many other things have been added. And as you go down the line, you can see that chicken nuggets end up having not a lot of the nutrients that are in the original chicken and a lot of the other stuff added. Orange soda arguably probably doesn't have much real orange in it at all, uh, just the flavoring. And then the processed um, American cheese food has less nutrients in it than the milk and so on. So these cards are there. And we have found that with children and adults, when you show this, they just kind of get it. They get, oh, I see. I should be eating things more that I can tell where it came from. And that makes a lot of sense. Then the next, the second theme, as I said, is mostly plants. And this is when we're eating whole foods, we really want to be eating more foods that come from plants and less foods that come from animals. And the way that we frame this in the curriculum is really getting them excited about eating all these different parts of plants. And these illustrations, which are from our Linking Food in the Environment Life curriculum series, the module on growing food that has lot of these drawings are actually, I think, a great way to see that we eat, you know, the roots, the stem, the leaves, the flower, the fruit, seeds, all these different parts of life as we were doing this. And just in the, as an aside, when we were developing the life curriculum and we were talking to students and we would talk about different foods, um, most of the students had had an experience at least hearing about going to a um, apple orchard and, and picking apples. And so every food that would come up, I would say, okay, then how does the farmer harvest that food? And they would say, the farmer reaches up on the tree and pulls it down. And then we would talk it through and realize that carrots are not up on trees, that farmers are reaching up and pulling them down. And so we thought that these illustrations would really show what the whole plants look like and the different parts of the plants that are in there. So this is the way that we hook students in, get them excited about eating all different foods that comes from plants. Obviously, you can stay off of these simple lessons to go into more about um, eating all different parts of foods from plants. And then the third one, as I said, is not too much. So we hope that these first two really are getting them excited about eating these really good quality foods that are right how they come from nature, and then thinking about having these small portions. And one of the things that we focus on here, in here, is how portion sizes have changed. And so this illustration here shows how Coke went from being a six and a half ounce bottle that was really the most common size from 1915 until the 1960s. And then that ended up changing about in the 1960s to the 12 ounce can. That's almost a doubling of the portion sizes um, right there. And then um, in 1993, the 20 ounce bottle came in. And so that, again, was making the portion size much larger, actually over tripling what the original portion size was. And that this now has become really the just normal portion. And for kids that are kids now, born way after 1993, they think of this as just you know the size to grab when, you're, when, when you want to have a drink. And so hopefully making them aware of that, making them aware of how much added sugar is in there, which in the curriculum too, then they would add up how much sugar is recommended to have in the day versus how much is in these drinks. And just to realize how off the scales the amount of sugar in these large portion sizes that our society has made become normal actually are. So that leads to the fourth theme of lesson four, and this one is to navigate through the environment. And basically that we do have an environment that makes it challenging to make healthy choices because of the advertising that's out there, the large portion sizes, and that 
because of the food system we have and, and you know, our, 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 our farm bill, that really a lot of the unhealthy foods are the things that are really inexpensive. So they're heavily available, um, taste good, advertise, and um, inexpensive. So that's obviously what kids are going to gravitate towards them. So we help them become aware that this is the kind of environment that we are used to looking at, where there's fast food places dotting our countryside, and supermarkets where instead of it being the fresh whole foods being dominant, we have these very large sections that are really these much more processed foods. So we want to seek out healthier options like this and find those in our environment and basically find the farmers markets, find the fruit stands, find all of the healthy places that are in our environment and seek those out and find them so that we can actually navigate through and make the healthy choices. This leads to the last one and this is to be an advocate that basically once we understand we want to eat these really healthy foods, that we want, really need to be conscious of not having too much and understand the complexities of, of our food system and how the foods are presented to us, that we realize that we do have to navigate through the environment, that we can become advocates that actually make the environment better for everyone. So in all of the lessons, there's always um, activity sheets for the students, and they make a little kind of contract for themselves for change. And this lesson is for the uh, class to come up with some idea that they can do that will actually make the food in their own environment, whether it be their classroom, their homes, their community, somehow make the environment better for people. And so for them to come up with their plan, write down their steps, and follow through with this plan. Um, as I said before, all of the lessons have individual kind of little um, action plans that the students can make that they can figure out a way to make change. In the last lesson, we want them to tie all these themes together so that they're doing them all, and so this is where they uh, bring that together. So to eat real in the future, I will eat some whole food in the first blank instead of some processed food in the second blank. So I will eat apples instead of an apple pop chart or whatever the child wants to write. And then that when they will try to follow a mostly plants diet, and they've seen my plate in the curriculum as well, which I didn't show today, but when will they actually try to have half their plate be fruits and vegetables at which meals? And then to follow the goal of not too much, I will small size and they will choose the specific food that they will either have less often, substitute with something else, or have a smaller size of. Seeking out the foods in their um, community, where they will shop, and what they will buy there in the places where they can find healthier foods, and then how they are going to advocate for change. So we hope that this will come together to help students really be healthier. And we have found um, in just using this curriculum ourselves, we've often connected it with cooking classes that we have with children. So we choose recipes that go with each of the themes so that children can learn that as well. Um, I would be happy, my email is on the slide, I would be happy to share with anybody some of what we have done. I would be happy to hear anybody's ideas about how other people have used this curriculum, um, stemmed other ideas off of it, and so that we can all help more children to learn about eating real and um, making healthier food choices for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, now we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers, and we have already several questions lined up for the presenters. And um, I will start with the question to you, uh, Pam, uh, from Teresa Avila, who is asking, uh, what about frozen foods, frozen whole foods? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so frozen whole foods we we think are fine, and, and I didn't say that during my presentation, but basically fruits and vegetables during, you know, seasons when you can get them fresh, that is nice, but frozen foods are an excellent option and um, should definitely be highlighted, and for many areas that's a great way to get fresh, fresh produce, and obviously the way that they are frozen in our food system now, um, they usually retain so many of the nutrients because they're frozen so quickly. Sometimes we'll talk to students about when you can get fresh to use the fresh option just because of the resources that are used for, for freezing it, but that frozen, free, frozen is a great option to have. Terrific. So just to remind everyone on the call that you can either type the questions in the question box or raise your hand and I will go ahead and mute you and you can uh, speak with, uh, with, with the panelists. So I see Natasha has got um, your hand raised. Uh, if uh, you are interested to ask a question, I'm going ahead and I unmute you and you can speak with the panelists.
Okay, well, while we are waiting for uh, Natasha, there is a question, a question from Jordan uh, Parkerton, and uh, I think it is for you, Hannah. Uh, Jordan is asking, where can one go online to learn the new standards? And uh, Jordan, if you could um, be more precise which standards you're asking about, or uh, uh, Hannah, uh, would you like to take this question? Yeah, I can take this question. So if you're talking about the new competitive food standards, I, I didn't put the actual link in my presentation, but if you just Google USDA Smart Snacks Interim Final Rule, or you could just do USDA Smart Snacks, then you'll get a link um, to USDA's um, web page that has a number of materials that are helpful um, in going through the, the new standards. So there's the actual interim final rule, and then there's some summary and fact sheets that are helpful. Um, but if you also want to email me, I can send you that link directly. Um, and my email is hjones at cspinet.org. And there is a question to you, uh, Pam. Uh, what is the target age or grade level for this curriculum? Oh, excellent question, and I should have said that. The curriculum itself is written for basically upper elementary to middle school age, and then if you go on to the Food Day website to the school section, you can download the curriculum. At the end of the curriculum, there are two appendices, and that is basically how to adapt it for younger children, so that would be younger elementary age and older children, which would be high school age, and so it tells you kind of what you can do in the lesson plans to do things differently for each of those age groups, and probably most most importantly is the student worksheets are actually, um, there's a, a separate set. So there's basically three different versions of the student worksheets, one for really pre-readers to so just starting to read, one for upper elementary, middle school age, and then for high school age, they kind of end up getting a little bit more um, complicated. Also in the curriculum, which I didn't mention, is there's some background information for teachers that I think gives teachers a good background on this. And then for every lesson, there's a full web page, or full, sorry, a full page worth of websites that have additional resources that teachers could use that I think that for young, you know, that would have basically have things for all ages, some things appropriate for younger children and some for older ch children. Thank you, Tom. We also have a question from Madison Weirdsell uh, who asks, Thoughts on how to engage the community along with schools in a food day event. How long before the event would you suggest advertising, and what kind of advertising do you think is optimal? So does anyone from the panel want to answer uh, this? And I can add some, some thoughts from our food day experience. Well, this is Pam. I can, I mean, I think uh, that's an excellent, excellent question, and I think it could probably have, um, Lots of different answers, but I think that if you can at least start to advertise at the beginning of the school year now that you're having something for people to hold the date, I think that would be good. I know for the different schools that we work with in New York City that some schools, you know, really do have a good online community for parents that basically getting it onto, you know, a listserv that goes out is an excellent way to get stuff out to the parents in the school. Other schools have, you know, newsletters or bulletin boards or other forms. So I think figuring out the way that you can get the information out. And then for the event itself, um, Lilia, you could probably add more on this, but I think it depends on the size and the scope of your event, how much it would take. I mean, you could do something really simple. In New York City, for the last couple of few days, one big event that's been around the city is just have everybody munch on an, an apple. Um, at, I think it's noon, and so you know that's something pretty simple, but at least gets everybody thinking about eating real. So I think the size and the scope will will depend on it. At Teachers College here, we've used the themes from our, our food day lessons and had tables on each of those themes with information for one of our food day events, and that ended up you know working nicely. And then you would have the resources from the curriculum. And Lily, I know you can add a lot more. Yeah, and I think that collaborating with groups like PTAs and other groups working with the schools is key to promote the event. And also, uh, there are many, many event examples uh, of what schools did on food day from uh, getting a classroom to a store and having a, a like, healthy uh, tour of the store with, with some suggestions. And cooking matters at the store, share with strength, has great resources for that. We also had uh, public schools in Boston, for example, that uh, had several high schools cooking for the community together, and uh, um, kids cook together with, their, with the community members. 
and uh, some schools used today to have a fundraiser and um, and invite both parents and, and students uh, to to come and support the school garden. Oakland schools hosted farmers markets in uh, in a, uh, almost a dozen of their schools last year. So um, get in touch with us, and we can continue brainstorming. We have um, several more questions coming. Uh, Christina Hopewell is asking Hannah, uh, do you have any tools or resources for specifically addressing pushback in school nutritional services departments? Both districts that I work with are not in compliance with federal mandates and really don't seem to have a desire to be. Can you repeat the question, Lilia? Was that for Hannah? Yeah, that was for Hannah. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. So, do you have any tools or resources for specifically addressing pushback in school nutritional services departments? Uh, Christina Hopewell says that both the uh, districts that she works with are not in compliance with federal mandates and really seem not to have a desire to be. So the question was, um, do we have any resources specific to what? Uh, to address and push back uh, from the school nutrition and services departments that are not interested to comply with the federal regulations, with the new rules for the school lunches. Oh, I see. So if, if there are um, folks who are resistant to exactly. um, complying, yeah. to have resources. Um, no, I don't know that we have um, direct resources um, available in that situation. Um, schools are required to comply if they are participating in the National School Lunch Program. Um, so, so that would be a different issue, and they are reviewed um, every three years. So they, they should be complying. Um, but I'm happy to um, email with whoever has that question and um, to look for some resources to share, um, or if there have been other schools or, or um, people who have dealt with issues, um, I could connect you with those people as well. Does that answer the question? She says that would be great. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm uh, passing to Christina your email address so she can get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. And Jordan has a question for, for Pam. Uh, the curriculum looks great, uh, but if my school wants to vary from the curriculum and say do just a cooking class to keep the first year simple, can the school still register and be part of food day? Well, I would say yes, of course. But Pam, what do you think? Absolutely. Anything that you can do, and even if you just want to take an idea from one of the lessons, we would love anything that y you would do. We put it together as a you know, five-lesson series just to have it there, but the main point of food day is to get food education out in whatever way will work for every school. Yeah, we encourage everyone to use multiple resources. The resources that we provide, also the Nourish Life curriculum, the resources of Hip Hop Public Health America, because there are a lot of great tools uh -huh. out there, and the main theme is uh, do something on food day that will help you to um, achieve the health and wellness goals in the school, not only on food day, but every day. Yes. There is a question from uh, Nicholas here for Pam. Where exactly can we get a list of those goals to eat real for food day online? Indeed. So um, it's, it's Where a can we get the Yeah, it's a little bit of a generic question. And um, I, uh, I think we can answer the food day okay. team. Where exactly? we can get a list of the goals to eat real for food day. Well, I know that there was some, um, which I didn't have in this slide, but some, there, you had some goals, Lilia, on the website before. I'm not sure um, if you mean the themes that I talked about or exactly a definition for eating real. I'm, I'm not positive I understand the question. Yeah, Nicole, the question is not very, very clear. If you uh, want to, uh, I can unmute you and you can speak with, uh, with Sam and with, with us, or you can just type uh, to, to help us to, to answer the question. But uh, Food Day has five priorities. It's a very broad platform and it goes from uh, addressing uh, diets and uh, food access, farm and food worker justice, sustainable agriculture, and also 
supporting like lo local community, and I think that's the platform for what it means eats re eating real for uh, for food day. Uh, those uh, five areas that uh, food day has selected, uh, where the improvements will help to improve their American system as a whole, and of course a lot depends on the choices of the consumers. So Nicola says, uh, oh, it's actually a very specific question. The goal is like, in the future, I will eat something instead of something. So if the, if he's asking oh, if there oh, is a list of those commitments that are okay. online. Yeah, so if you, if you go to the curriculum, then, um, I mean, for so for each of those, that was the summary one that are really is the take home from the last lesson for the students. But then, you know, for example, for the Eat Real one, there are several examples on the page. And, and obviously, all those foods from the cards that I showed very quickly in my presentation could be other examples. But the lesson goes through, and each child is supposed to pick out their own example of what they would want to do that fits in with their lives. So something that they know they eat right now that is a food that is a changed a little or changed a lot food, and what is a real food that they could eat in place of those and they make that little contract so it's a whole sheet on that um, right there. And then for all the other ones, it's the, it's the same thing. So in the lesson two, they actually drew a meal that represented my plate of having half their plate fruits and vegetables. And so then that's what they are making the commitment to. So that was the summary one at the end. Um, and if you have any more questions, if the curriculum itself isn't clear, then please let me know, and I'll say my email was on the slides, but I'll say it again. It's pak14 at tc for Teachers College dot Columbia dot edu. Resource. And we will be sharing the slides with all the participants on the call, and the webinar is recording. We will share the link to the recording, and we can also share the context of the presenters. So. Well, thank you so much uh, to uh, everyone uh, who joined the webinar today. And thanks uh, so much to our uh, panelists, to um, Andrea Falcon from the US Department of Education, who is in charge of Green Ribbon Schools uh, Recognition Award, to Kirk Bergstrom from WorldLink, uh, to Hannah Jones from CSCI, and to Pam Koch uh, from Columbia Teachers College. And uh, email us at foodday at csbinet.org if you have any questions or suggestions. And we are looking forward to seeing the great events that um, you will decide to organize on Foodday. And we really appreciate your help in getting this momentum going. Thank you very much.